Yes, we. That's better audio now. Yeah. All sorry, right. Sweet. My other headphones. Okay. You're. Oh, oh look at that. He went to tournament. He's got two headphones, Yuli. Look at this guy. He's got. He's, <laughs> no, he's got more headphones than like me and you combined. <laughs> um. Okay. So yes, welcome. Thank you for joining us, AB. Always fun to have you on Tour Life and Talk. I guess my first question is, how much of a relief do you feel now getting that first one? out of the way i mean i don't even think i can explain it it's just my entire disc golf career has just been like oh when's he gonna get that first one when's it gonna happen and then i've been so close so many times and to finally do it it just it really hasn't even sunk in yet it just it's crazy and we don't even really have time to like let it sink in because we're jumping straight into a tournament in two days the memorial so yeah, it's just been a crazy feeling. Could you feel, cause I had no idea that you, this was your 11th lead card. This was your 11th time that you're in a pretty good position to win a tournament. Could you feel that throughout that round? Like the buildup of like, okay, here we go again. Like this is another chance. Don't, I can't blow this one. I got to take it. Like is, did that just get higher and higher every single time you put yourself in that position? Um, it does. I'm not entirely sure if this is correct, but I think that was my first time ever leading going into a final round at an elite or anything like that. And that just gave me some extra confidence. And I felt like I have this lead already. I've already finished out around with the lead. I can do it again. And I just kept my confidence and to get one shot at a time. Is there a scarier person than Ricky Wysocki chasing you down? Like, is there, is there anyone else out there that you think would be scarier to have on your heels right now? I mean, not really, honestly. It's like Ricky and Macbeth are obviously the two most intimidating disc golfers ever. And, but Ricky's a lot more vocal when he's playing with you. Like he's just in your face with the fist bumps and the claps and, when he screamed yeah at me on hole 17, that was pretty scary. And I was like, wow, this is really happening. I've seen this so many times and it's like happening to me right now. But do you I think that deep. was directed towards you? Cause I watching it back, there was a small crowd that hole 17 for those that watched and didn't play. It's, it's not a great hole for spectators. It's, it's a very, very tight leading into that hole. Yeah. So there was like four or five people, which I don't even know if they were even supposed to be back behind that basket. <laughs> Uh, but there was one of the rooks just standing yeah. there. <laughs> there was a couple people behind the basket and then you know the camera people all all you guys the competitors and then i think maybe some more fans were behind you guys Do, did you feel like that was like directed towards you though and not kind of directed towards like the main group i mean i don't know honestly it was like i was the closest one to him so i heard it the loudest i wasn't I wasn't like looking at him. I already knew he was going to make it. I just had a feeling that I was going in. I mean, it's Ricky Wysocki. I, I, every putt he went up to, I expected him to drill it. But yeah, when he yelled that, it was pretty intimidating. And it made me whiff that 25 footer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God that didn't go OB. That would have been, that would have been yeah. real dicey. Um, what, what do you think was the biggest, if you could like, pinpoint one thing what was like the biggest difference between this time and all the other times that you had a chance to win um i'd been leading since the beginning of the tournament so i just knew that i was throwing the disc better than everyone that weekend and i just it felt like every shot i had the confidence that i knew i was going to execute it and it just snowballed into more and more confidence and then that shot on hole 18, I just, I knew I was going to throw it well. I'd been thinking about it all day and I've replayed that shot in my head so many times, just throwing my Athena dead straight up that hill and I made it happen. It was just building confidence throughout the entire week. Was the way that hole 18 was structured, did that also kind of help the confidence a little bit of where if that hole was more of a throw until you land on the island hole? Would that, do you think that changed a little bit? Did, did it, did it, did you feel like you could confidently throw that sh second shot? Cause to me, the tournament was almost won 
when you landed in the fairway on your first shot. Because if you do the math, you literally throw your second shot into the into the cliff. And then yeah. you go up there and you can make the putt to save your par, or you can lay up, tap in for Bur- uh, for bogey. And then if mm-hmm. Ricky birdies, then I guess you guys are in a playoff in that situation. Yeah. Um, but you couldn't lose really once you were safe in the fairway. Did, did that, that the numbers go through your head at all? Or were you just focused on, Hey, I got to throw this in bounds. Uh, yeah. After I checked the scores after hole 17, I just knew that first one had to be in bounds to like, really really have a chance to win the tournament and to go into playoff and i'm glad it didn't go into a playoff because he definitely would have had the momentum and i'm not sure how it would have went but i was gonna say do you know what I hole just, you guys would have played no i have no okay. idea yuli do you know no yeah. clue okay yeah. <laughs> yeah no no one knows it would have been a surprise <laughs> for all of us yeah. i'm glad it didn't happen that way though i know but yeah. Um, well, well, what about yeah. like, what about like off season, you know, first tournament of the season, you're playing in practice, you know, you're playing well. Was there some sort of confidence from, from practice as well leading into there? Did you know you were going to be in the hunt or was it like a surprise? Like, okay, I'm okay. Yes. I'm playing good. I'm here again because I guess my question is we've all known that eventually it was going to happen. And that's a big story with especially you around the disc golf world is, okay, here's a B and is he going to choke again? Right. Is he going to choke again? Like they talk about European open. That's all I hear. Oh, he's going to blow it. Blah, 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 blah. Even going into the last round. If you look at the comments down in the pro tour, it was, Oh, a B not going to be able to hold it. Or is he, or people being like, Oh, this is his time to do it. M- moving forward. Were you like, no, I'm going to get this done the first tournament of the year and shut everybody up. Or was it just something that just randomly happened through the course of the tournament? Um, it really started like the first day I got to the course, like Paul Macbeth picked me up from the airport and we went straight there and it was his first time playing it as well. And well, like his first time playing like the new course and we were playing it and I was like telling him, I was like, I think I'm gonna be hard to beat out here. I don't think you have a chance this week. Like just messing around, we were talking to each other. And then, yeah, I just, I played, I think like eight practice rounds and we got the, we got the early practice with like the pressure for the all-star event as well in those tough conditions. So I just really felt prepared like better than I have for tournaments in the past because I was there two weeks early just ready to go. And it was just a huge confidence building from the moment I got to the property. Because from my perspective, when I think of a storyline for this season, there can't be a better start for you. Somebody with this much potential who was close all this time. And then you just stomp that out. And now to me, looking at it, it's like, okay, the sky's the limit for this guy. You know what I mean? And we're going to see yeah. moving forward, but I, I don't know. I just feel like it was like something that you see in like storybooks. You know what I mean? Like it's not a real thing like this kid, blah, blah, blah. And then bam, he does it first tournament of the year shuts and, everybody up. And it wasn't like there, it, you know, there was a who's who of people in that top 10. Yeah. You, had a, you had a charging mm-hmm. Ricky down your breath. A Go- goose man was playing great. That final round. He shot a course yeah. record it wasn't like a tournament and we've seen some of these of where, you know, the top guys just don't show up for whatever. And, and someone can kind of steal a win away. Uh, mm-hmm. You had some big names chasing you down and you just played so well that you got so far out in front that they just didn't have enough holes to, to, to track you down. And uh, again, the way you played 18 was absolutely perfect. That's, that's literally the best way you can play that hole. Do you think, kind of going back to what you always talking about in the practice situation, the, you know, those two weeks of practicing on that course had to have helped, not just you getting comfortable with that course, but you're not practicing courses like that in the off season. Mm-hmm. You're playing out in the desert, all open hyzer shots. Yeah. Vista has some sort some holes that are low ceiling a little bit, but you're not getting any scrambling practice like out there. So do you, do you see yourself maybe seeing how, 
uh, successful you were with that much practice. And maybe like a course that's very similar, New London World Championship, also designed by Paul Macbeth. Do you see yourself maybe trying to get up there a, you know, a week earlier than you normally would to get a lot more practice in? Yeah, it's just... I've been working out a lot this off season, getting stronger to like help my body, like handle lots and lots of reps. So I'm just going out to the course and just throwing as many possible shots just to get like comfortable and familiar with the holes. And it really, it really benefits. Honestly, I think the more practice rounds I have at a course, the better I'll play. Hmm. Well, let's take, so let's take you back to your, I want to get kind of dive into your mental before, before this, what was your mental? Like, were you, are you the type of guy who is just like, okay, just give me enough time. I'm going to get a win. Or was it like, why is this keep happening to me? Uh, you know what I mean? And then that beca- uh, eventually becomes your identity because it's happening all the time to where you're like, I just can't break through every, t- every time somebody plays better or I blow up on 16 and it, and that comes out of nowhere. And that's not me. You know what I mean? Are you the type of person who's just like, Nope, just give me time. It's going to happen. Or was it more of a surprise? Um, it was honestly a mix of both. Like I felt like, wow, am I ever going to win one of these things? And then some days I'll be like, oh yeah, I'm just going to win the next tournament. It's just like, I don't really know. It's like a crazy mental thing with myself that I had. And I was just trying not to think about it at all this week. And I led the tournament the whole way through and won it. And it was just, yeah, a mix of both. So one thing that we saw at the European Open was Paul Macbeth coming onto your bag later in the round, final round. Who who was your caddy the final round, and did he caddy for you the entire tournament? And it, was that something that helped? Um, I didn't have a caddy uh, any of the rounds before that, and then he came on hole, I think six or seven. And who but, is this guy? No, he's talking um, about your Pino. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm talking oh. about this tournament. Sorry. Oh, you're talking about this one. Okay, yeah. I'm talking about this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, it was my girlfriend's little sister's boyfriend, and I got him into disc golf like a year ago, and he just instantly fell in love with it, and he goes to, uh, what is it, UCF, and so yep. he's out uh, in yep. Orlando, so he drove up every day, and he just wanted to caddy for me, and he was just literally like the perfect caddy, like, he kept up with me because I know I like to run off like down the hills and stuff and get in front of everyone. And he would keep up with me, put, set my bag right in front of me every time I sat down or anything. And he'd give me fist bumps and just kept me a super level head. Like I had really no reason to be frustrated. I was always comfortable and he was just the perfect caddy. And I owe a lot to him because he was a huge part of that victory. So do you see yourself changing? Cause I think this is one of the biggest blind spots that a lot of players have. And I, I understand that, you know, not everyone is in a position that that can have a consistent caddy with them, but there are so many players on tour that based off of who they're playing with, like the players on their card can actually help them play better or not because they can be like open and talk with them. And I think yeah. you could have that every single time you play, if you have a caddy you're comfortable with. So do you see yourself kind of changing and going away from like, I'm just going to carry my bag and be a lo- you know, by myself kind of thing. Or do you see yourself looking into maybe trying to find a caddy for future events as well? Um, yeah, I'm just, the thing is for me with, with like a caddy for a tournament is it has to be like consistent. It has to be the same person. And it has to be every single round. Or if I've I'm seen just, you had like eight, I've seen you had like Adam jump on your bag yeah. or you have like Austin Turner jump on your bag, like for the final round. Yeah. And you're, you think that's kind of maybe in the past, it's kind of hurt you a little bit, not having them with you the entire time. And all of a sudden now you have a caddy for the final round. Yeah. I would say it's, it's just inconsistent for me. And it just like, I don't know if I, if I just carry my bag for the first three days, I might as well just carry the rest of the day. Cause mm-hmm. I've been, I'm in that groove doing my own thing. And then same thing. If I have a caddy, I want them to be the same person every single day of the tournament. Yeah, for sure. Yuli, do you have anything? I mean, you, you're one of the few guys on tour that has a caddy consistently. Do you think that's also like a blind spot for a lot of guys? Do you think a lot of people could benefit from having someone? 
I think it's it's when somebody says, hey, if you were to ask one of the top players and give them advice of what they could do to be better, that's the one thing I would say that a lot of these guys don't have, which is a huge benefit is a full-time caddy who you trust, who can do all that stuff for, for you. I mean, uh, you know, I travel with Anthony and Adam and Austin and they get to hang out with Brad, my caddy all the time. This dude does everything for me. Like he is an absolute rock star, maniac, positive, the most positive person ever. Without him, who knows how the last couple seasons were go? Because he was one of my only bright spots. He was the only person telling me like that I was good enough. You know what I mean? And when I see these other players just carrying their own bag, first of all, you carrying your own bag. I don't care how good of shape you are. By the end of the round, you're not as fresh as you could have been if somebody else is carrying your bag. Period. No matter what, like this. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what level, it was was essential to have a caddy there. I don't know how people played that course without a caddy. And then I see other times where all of a sudden the rain comes. This actually happened. The featured card. Nobody had the caddy on the last hole, and they all absolutely blew it. I couldn't believe it. They didn't have a caddy. They didn't have an umbrella. I was like, "How is this (laughs) possible?" And I think Calvin like doubled the last hole or something. And listen, I promise you, if he has a caddy there and he has two umbrellas and he has a dry disc and a towel, he's not double bogeying that hole. He's too good. You know what I mean? He's he's just not. And so when I see the top players all do this, I think it's the easiest thing to fix. I mean, what if it's, if you look at like, let's say a Calvin and I'm just speaking on, my opinion, obviously he might get a caddy and then blow up. I don't know, but let's just say hypothetically that this caddy saves you five shots total the whole entire year. How many times did it come down to the last hole in so many tournaments for like a Calvin? It could, it could Mm. possibly yeah. Get you at the stroke that you need to get over the hump for a win. Yeah. Um, and it's all hypothetical, like I said. But that's when somebody asks me, that's what I say. I think a caddy is essential. There's a reason there's a reason that, you know, the top players in traditional golf have great caddies. They carry their stuff all the time and they trust. Um, I don't know. That's what I think about that whole thing. Also, AB, you were correct. Our statistician, Ed, Edwin Stats, just confirmed this was the first time AB went into the final round with the lead. He has had the lead after two rounds and a few four-round events, Las Vegas last year being the most recent. So you were right. Sweet. There you go. Um, Silas, are you there? <laughs> Silas? I'm here. That sounds so What's de- up? That sounds so desperate, Yuli. <laughs> You right, Yuli? You go. You okay over there, bud? You could hear me. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it took that. me to a screen by myself. I was all alone and unprotected. Uh, yeah, that's what it sounded scared. like. You sound like a, <laughs> a scared little puppy in a corner. That's oh. funny. Oh, where you go? Oh, there he is. You're popping back. All right, AB. A couple, a couple fun questions here for you. Um, this was sent in surprisingly by a lot of people. A lot of people want to know this. I have no idea where this came from. People, people are uh, starting to assume that you don't like your nickname, AB. Why would they assume that? I, there's just, there's just been some scuttlebutt of people saying I don't think <laughs> AB actually likes his. I think Anthony Barella doesn't like his nickname AB, which I thought was weird because it's not like uh, we're calling you like the Terminator, and it's like yeah. a really. <laughs> Like it's just, like it's just your initials and a, a lot of people do that already. Yeah. My parents have called me AB since I was one years old. Like it's always just been like what I reply to. And one thing is uh, when Gossage or Ezra or Tristan call me Tony, that one, I don't, I don't know. About yeah. That one. <laughs> yeah. They do that to get under your skin for sure. Yeah, I know. Um, okay. So anyone that wants to come up and get a picture or a, uh, an autograph, you can call him yeah. AB. He will not, he will not get upset. Yeah. Um, okay. Glad, glad we got that. All right. <laughs> First tournament. I, I, I didn't want to have to come out of retirement. Okay. I didn't. I was happy in my own little <laughs> world 
not doing anything, chilling, seeing, you know, seeing these photos at the end of these tournaments and just biting my tongue and looking the other way. <laughs> I got to ask, Saz is going to put the photo up. Yep. What are we thinking here? Um, at first, I was a bit confused. I actually held it up the wrong way because I thought there was something on the other side of it. <laughs> but then they told me to turn it around, and I was like, oh, it's just a chessboard. But, <laughs> yeah, in the moment, I was like, I didn't really care about the trophy. I just won the sure. tournament, so it didn't really of course. matter. And then after the round, Jeff Corns told me that it's going to get personally engraved, and then I'm going to get, like, a whole chess set, like, all the pieces and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, but, I think the end result is definitely sick. I think yeah. it's going to turn out to be really nice. Um, the problem is uh, most people aren't going to know that. Yeah, they have no right? idea. Mo most people just think that you got a, you know, someone went into a Target or a Walmart. I think <laughs> someone was saying, like, some high-level chess players were saying, like, that's actually a really nice chess board. Like, it's a, it's, yeah, that's what again... I mean. Again, we would have no idea. Yeah, I but, didn't um, know at all. Um, but I guess that is some sort of like kind of nice, classy chessboard. The thing I, I get, and again, chess.com invitational, maybe Silas will throw this other photo up. If there was only something else that they could have like come up with and made like a really sick trophy that was like, if there was, yeah. if there was like something, yeah. if there was like something that was like, uh, like feminine that they could give to like FPO that had like chess. And then there was something that was like masculine, like, um, like if there was like a royalty thing, if there was something like that, that they could have given out, yeah, I think okay. people would have loved that. But unfortunately I don't think there was anything that they could have tied in. So chess board, I guess was the only, was maybe the only thing there. So, um, but I got. I, yeah, I'm. All, I, I guess I'm out of retirement officially, and I'm back into the the rating, uh, chess tro uh, not, sorry, rate, rating we'll, trophies. We'll rate it. Yeah, give us the rating. Um. Okay. So this is an item that I cannot find in my garage. I don't put my chess boards <laughs> in my garage, so that definitely bumps it up. Uh, but because there was such a clear like. They could have made a, a sick trophy, like a glass king and a glass queen and had your name. It could have been so sick. I think I got to give this a four. But I'm willing to I'm willing to increase it. If you want to send me a photo once they engrave it and they give you the chest set and everything, if you want to send me a photo of the full trophy, I'm willing to increase that four. I will. And then you can post it on Twitter. I'll post it on Twitter and you you can like, uh, you can be, uh, do this for me, have like the King and like slowly have it like tipping over. That would be the perfect photo. Okay. Like <laughs> checkmate. Speaking of checkmate, do you want to, do you want to promo this, uh, this disc that's coming out for your win? Yeah. We got the commemorative TI swirl zones for the Chescott. They made a sweet stamp and I'm super pumped about it. And yeah, go check them out on teamdiscrap.com. You can pre-order them right now. Just I'm, it's been a long time coming for one of those. And, and I'm, I'm loving how quick they're it. doing this now. Yeah. I feel like two, three years ago, Yuli, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm feeling like this was sometimes like two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Yeah. They would come out with a disc from like a, a win a month ago that people kind of forgot about. So this was I, I saw this yesterday, I feel like. Or yeah. maybe I even saw something Sunday night talking about it. Um, I could be crazy there, but yeah. So go check that out. That's going to be on, is that going to be on yours on yours or is that just discraft.com? Uh, that's going to be on the team page on mine. Okay. There it, there is. it is. Silas has it up. Look at that. Oh, that's that freaking is so sick. cool. Oh yeah. That is a sick, <laughs> sick thing. Uh, who's better at chess? You or Gooseman? Goss is better. He's a, okay. he likes to nerd out on the chess. He plays it 24 seven. He does play it a lot now. <laughs> Yuli, are yeah. you nice with the uh, are you nice with the pieces? I just played Goss uh, a couple days ago, oh, and it w and we had a draw. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? The, you ran out of time or what? Yeah, he he was leaving, and so he was just destroying <laughs> me. So I put the button that was like draw <laughs> question mark, and he, <laughs> he accepted it. And he accepted um, it. So I don't know. The, I mean, 
I guess the jury's still in session for that one, man. Mm. Last jury match. <laughs> um, he's good. He's good. I, I I used to play when I was a kid, but I haven't played a lot in a long time. And and <laughs> Goose was saying that he was practicing a lot because he was hoping to play Magnus. And I mean, that would have been exciting. Have you guys seen those chess books though, where it's essentially they have like in game, so it's just a photo of a ch- of like an in like let's say thirty moves into a game. There's a photo. And there's one way for you to automatically win. Like there's, if you do a certain thing, you will win a hundred percent of the time. And you got to figure out like the eight moves, the nine moves, the 10 moves that you have to do to win. Have you guys seen those books? Yeah. I know that. Yeah. There was a guy on my bus back in high school and that's what he would just study these books and like, it was, dude, these guys are nutty, nutty, nutty. Um, are you going to get into any, uh, is this like now going to make you interested in playing chess more or is that just, uh, yeah, no. I actually downloaded the app when I found out that they were sponsoring the tournament. Cause I had it like a few years ago. Okay. And then the uh, CEO actually came up to us in the practice field and he's like, I'll trade you some disc golf tips for a free year membership. And I was like, oh, oh heck right, perfect. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he gave me the diamond membership for free for a year. And I've been playing. I've been playing a couple matches a day, just messing around with it. It's pretty fun. You got to reach back out now that you won and see if you can boost that up to a couple extra years. I feel like a win yeah. at their tournament <laughs> should be a couple extra years. Like a the lifetime. Guy's kinda, the guy's kind of nice, too. His throw yeah, he had He's was actually kind of nice. Yeah, I was expecting him to be like a beginner, but then he just he had a smooth throw. Yeah, he it, was, it was down and everything. It was not too shabby at all. Um, let's talk about the course a little bit. Cause I want, I want you, we haven't gotten into it at all. I wanted to hold that, hold off on talking about that until you popped on. What was your overall, I mean, again, I don't think you're a person though. There are some people on tour that based off of their performance that decides whether they think a course is good or not. You're not one of those people. So I think even though you did win, I think you can be critical and say what you actually think about the course. So what were your thoughts on Olympus? Uh, I loved it. I thought it was a beautiful property and I love courses that have a lot of sidearms and have like those tight straight gaps. Cause that's like my favorite shot to throw. And I'm most confident with like hitting those small gaps with like a fairway driver. And there's like a lot of shots where you have to down tempo and place it in a landing zone. And I like to, I like to club up and then slow down my throw for shots like that. So I think that was super beneficial. And yeah, it's just it was a great course and it really played well in my game. Sounds like you're judging it off of your performance <laughs> a little well, bit. I am. <laughs> I am, but. I, Northwood Black's my favorite course on the planet, and I got 150th at Ledgestone. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they have similar shots, but I love the course. It's easily in my top 10 now. Yeah. You, have, you haven't played New London yet either, have you? No. You haven't been no, out there yet? Is that yeah. the... Is that the one on the golf course or the wooded no, one? No, the one on the golf course is called Ivy Hills. New London is the one that the Ivy Hills was designed by Nate Heinold and his team. New London was okay. designed by Paul um, in the city of, uh, oh man, why am I blanking on what that city is? It's not Lynchburg. It's um, Bedford. Forest. Bedford. Thank you, size Bedford, city of Bedford. Um, so this course. I, I was, I had my doubts because we talked to Calvin a little bit in the off season and he was saying, you know, throw down the mountain. He's played out there quite a bit. He was saying it was going to need a lot of work. If you walked around, you got to see like the old tee pads. It was just like a really small piece of rubber. Right. Yeah, and so, and yeah, the tee pads I thought were great. I didn't really have, I mean, the weather wasn't phenomenal. Like there was going to be a lot of mud and water on them. And I thought yeah. they held up pretty good still. I do worry about those tee pads though, because if they do get played a lot, I think those type that type of turf can get um, what is it run down really easily in that yeah. one spot and get kind of slick. But for us, I thought the tee pads were great. I was most surprised with the greens. I thought there were so many unique greens, and 
not only did you have to think about how you wanted your disc to approach the green, like angle wise, but also there were so many um, different difficult putts, different elevation changes, and then the roll away potential. I just thought we don't really, maybe we get a couple greens like that on courses, but it, I couldn't really think of a green where I was just like, yeah, this one doesn't really make sense. This is kind yeah. of not that great of a green. I thought most of the greens were really, really fascinating. And to me, that's a huge thing because a lot of times we play these courses where they just put a basket somewhere in the middle and you land 60 feet from it and you have a wide open putt. Mm -hmm. And that was not the case at this course. Yeah, there was um, a lot more strategy involved with the scrambling at this course into the greens, which is, I think, I think you need to implement that into every single course because some of these courses you can just throw a spike hyzer from anywhere and park it. Yeah. But here you have to really trust your angles and match the hillsides and stuff like that. I didn't have many cons, but the few that I had, I, I wasn't a big fan of hole one being hole one. I think it's a good hole. I just, I don't think it's a great starting hole. Um, and then, and also it's just not good. You know, if you have a huge crowd, which I'm sure you had a way bigger crowd than I did at nine 20 in the morning. Um, it's, it's not easy for a big crowd to kind of see the shot. Cause if you're five or 10 feet back off your angle kind of gets cut off with the trees yeah, with in the, line. Uh with the hill and the trees. If mm -hmm. you're like in the first, like right on the edge, you can kind of see the whole shot. But you know, if you have a massive crowd, I think it, that might be a little bit tricky there for hole one. And then the only other hole that like jumped out at me is like, ah, I wish they could try to figure out something was hole 17. I thought that was the only hole that I saw guys throw their shot and then literally look at the spotter to be like, am I inbounds or not? No one really knew yeah. if they threw a good shot or not. And to me, especially late in a round, I don't like having that flukiness. And we saw a lot of fluky stuff on that hole where some people skipped in bounds, some people clipped a tree and dropped and were safe. So, and I know you talked about in your, your post, um, post interview, how you didn't really know how to play that hole. I don't know if anyone really knew how to play that hole. Yeah. I, where you're at I the stock like on 17. The, I felt like I threw the same exact shot all three rounds off the tee. And different two results. Of them, two of them were out of bounds, and one of them wasn't even close to being bounds. It's just, I don't know. I it thought was it was just, one of the better holes on the course. Honestly, you liked it, really. The only thing I would change is I would take the OB by the trees and I'd put it farther down, so that people aren't trying to crush it into the trees because you potentially could go OB. And that way, like a B seventy three. What, what are you talking about right now? Are you talking about the T shot? The T -shot? The shot. The T shot going over and then into the trees. There's the OB line. Oh, but you're I, saying the far OB line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Past I'm the water. Okay. Because I don't want to see people throwing hard, trying to crash into the trees, hit down and then throw their approach or whatever and being like, oh, I can get par no matter what. But if you push that OB line I would say even just five feet farther into the tree line, you take that kind of out of play. Everybody's going to play the same shot, but I watched Ricky throw a shot, hit the stuff, come down inbounds. And then I watch other people just float too low and then skip out of bounds. So it was like, it was like kind of a luck, luck factor. What I like about the hole is it brings a classic shot back into the equation on a really, really tough par four on a short par four. To where you have to have touch over the water that lands soft into a landing area and then another touch shot into another tight green. I don't think we see that often on our courses right now as we see them anyway. I think the because it's a blind shot, though, it's, I think it's – if it wasn't a blind shot – Every there was shot's some, a blind shot up there. <laughs> there's a lot of blind shots on the course, I know. Uh -huh. But I, I just think because it's a blind shot – like AB was saying, I just didn't see guys throw it. And we see this all the time. Guys throw it and immediately turn around. AB, when you threw your shot on 18, you knew instantly, boom, nailed it. It's money. And that shot, I just never saw anyone throw it and were confident. And to me, coming down the stretch, I would, I, 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 that's my only, my only complaint is I, I don't, I just thought it was a little fluky. 
where people yeah, were throwing just, shots and they didn't know if it was know good or bad. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That was my only thing. Is like you could throw ten shots and you could be like, that one's good, that one's good, that one's bad, and you could be wrong about all three of them. But I like the second shot a lot, and I like the whole, I like the concept of the hole. What if? Okay, what about this? What if they somehow built the tee pad up? I don't know if they could do that. But what if they built the tee pad up to where you're level with the gap you're hitting, to where you had a little bit more of a visual on your landing zone? Yeah, maybe Did that ruined the hole. I think I I think part of the part of the hole is you have to trust your shot and not being able to see kind of makes it like that much tougher. You know what I mean? Like you have well, yeah, to, cause it's, it's more here's the thing. no, no, no. If you throw a stable putter on Anheuser through that gap, okay. you have complete control over the shot. People weren't doing it because that's a harder shot to throw. If you throw it with Anheuser through that gap, you could pull it into the stuff and you're bringing the bigger side of the lake involved. If I throw putter with Anheuser through that shot high, I can turn around if I hit the gap middle because I know it's going to be good. Everybody's throwing with Heiser to try to just get through the gap, and then you bring the left side into play. And that's why everybody's like, okay, I know I didn't play it the perfect way. It's when you pull it on accident with the same shot, that's when you actually knew it was probably going to be good. You know what I'm saying? Does that yeah, make sense yeah. or no? Yeah, it it does sense. make sense. I, I still just think the landing zone for a blind shot is just so tiny. That's my only thing is it's like, it's a, so it's such a small landing yeah. zone for a blind shot. And, um, yeah. and when it gets windy, it's impossible. <laughs> it really is. Cause <laughs> yes. you could throw a good shot and then it's like, Oh, it could just drop right into Who the knows pond. What's yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the course was, was very good um, with variation though. I, I didn't feel like I was uh there was so there was a lot of par fours that you were like like you were saying A B, you were throwing like kind of placement shots and like trying yeah. to just th- th- there was maybe what two or three holes where you're throwing like uh maybe more, four or five holes that you were throwing like full power shots. But it didn't yeah. it didn't it didn't seem like a, a a repeating course, which I liked. I thought there was a lot of variety. Yeah. So I thought that was good. Um, did you guys hear anything from like spectators on the ground? Cause that's the only other kind of complaint or con, I guess you oh, could it, say about the tournament is like, it wasn't the greatest for spectators on the ground. Yeah, there's like two or three holes where they can't even see a single shot on the hole. Yeah, they just aren't even allowed to go back there. I'm fine yeah. with that. I'm fine with, with a, with a area where spectators can't go if it's a good course, but I keep saying this. There has to be a hangout spot to where they're not going there. Mm. They go to a certain spot. They can watch on a big yeah, screen and, yes. and they can see them play. They can get a couple drinks or something, buy a couple mm. discs, buy some stuff. And then, Oh, here they come out of the spot. Okay. Time to go. And then they can follow them. Yeah. I, I always think that there should be something like that. And they're never they could put one of those behind the fairway on hole 18, like way deep yeah. past the flags. I thought Ooh. that would be a perfect area. Yeah. yeah. Or, or like when they were down into the goalie after that uh, venom sidearm that you would park down the hole every time, and that's oh, in between cool. a lot of holes. Yeah, that like big that, that big area that right big, there. That big area. That's where a lot of people were hanging out anyway. Mm-hmm. So there's, I really felt like there should have been something right there, like a nice little vending area or something to where people were just there. Blah 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 blah. Yeah, and poor, it's kind of a way. That was nice. That was nice. <laughs> I I love the bodies. course. It was one of my favorite courses that I played in a long time. I will be going back because I liked it so mm, much. It was a my, lot of fun. I do have one complaint. Ooh. I freaking can't stand throwing down a damn road. <laughs> oh, I knew you were gonna hate sixteen. <laughs> I knew you were gonna hate sixteen. Dude, it's a road, bro. Or it's got mulch hole on three. It. Hole three. Road. I like I like getting ready to oh. throw a shot and hearing some guy in a giant pickup truck blasting it as loud as he can down the freeway. <laughs> and then there was another one that actually actually hurt the tournament. It was a tight par four that like you had like seventeen options 13. off the tee, and then it goes like straight up to the left. 
over oh, the hill. Oh gosh, that hole, that hole was. Did you ever birdie that hole, AB? Oh, which hole? Oh, is that? One, are you talking about hole no? 11? I think it's like four. Are you talking about four? No, you no, got no, no, throw no. down, and then like you have the two fairways after your tee shot. I'm talking about the shorter one that has like yeah, that's twenty hole in the corner. Hole eleven. I actually, I love that. Oh, hole. in the corner. I love yeah, the hole you go too. down and it's then like up. One of my favorite holes. Yeah, but I landed in the middle of the fairway mm-hmm. after the rain, and they drove their dumb little freaking thing up and down that thing, and it was just a mud pit <laughs> because it's a road. Did you notice that? I landed in the yeah, middle. I couldn't yeah, run I up because it was a mud yeah, pit. It was sloppy. I'm like, come on, That's man. Did you birdie <laughs> four on Saturday and Sunday? Oh man. <laughs> Did you birdie hole four at all? Uh either one of you guys? I seven no. and five it. I thought that was the hardest. Bro. I think that was the hardest hole to birdie. I had yeah. two putts at birdie from down the hill to the right. I would actually yeah. go over the top and crash go the trees. Like over. Oh, Off your tee shot. Yes. You would, yeah. you would just blast a tee shot over it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that, you did that on Friday too gap. in the wind. Yeah. I did it every day. Gosh, I, was five I thought over for sure. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that hole. I mean, the people I was playing with guys, that hole ate our lunch. That yeah. was, <laughs> that would have been exciting to come out and watch how, <laughs> how the people I was playing with played that hole. Um, my card too, man. My card too. It was brutal. <laughs> I, yeah, I, even the people in front of me were like coming back from the tee oh. and like losing their discs. <laughs> we're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I think, I think this is a course though that gets a lot better as it gets worked in because there were still some holes where I was like, that bush probably shouldn't be there. Like, you know, like that's pretty much in the fairway. That's a good shot. The Christmas tree, dude. There, oh, there was, the there was three. still. There's there's still some stuff that needs to kind of get cleaned up, and I think it will. Um, I think they also need to try to figure out what they're doing with the cliff situation, because I forgot to mention this, Yuli. I took my first ever, uh, and I'm curious if you guys have ever have, have have had this happen to you. I took my first ever penalty stroke after a round. I got pen, I got a penalty stroke. Have you guys mm-hmm. ever gotten a penalty stroke? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Lots of times. <laughs> oh, from what? Oh, Playing played, holes uh, wrong, yeah, uh, doing all kinds of stuff. Okay. Well, I guess I haven't playing long enough, but I threw um, on one of the holes. Is it five? It might be five. Is five the one where you go down and into the left? Yeah. Down or is like it you throw like you'll four? throw like a zone down and then your yeah. next one's like a four, power five. forehand That's up into six. the little cove. Oh, s- six. It's right yeah. next to that really uh, that really cool par three where you throw like a big turnover or you throw a forehand. Yeah, that's it's like six. hole eighteen, and then that hole, and then that hole six. Yep. So I threw it. It clipped the tree. There it is. Size has it. I threw it. Clipped the tree on the way out. Came backwards, and that cliff right there. There's like roots and stuff growing out of the cliff, and there's a bunch of dead limbs on it. So it landed and it's levitating on like the cliff, like two, three feet off the cliff. And I looked at it and I was like, I, I'm like, I, I can't play that. I'm <laughs> it's, it's on a cliff. Like I will die. Um, and so everyone on my card was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we'll just play it how we play all the other cliffs, right. Of where you just take it to a safe spot. And so I did that. And then after the round, someone brought it up to the TD and was like, oh, hey, Brody did this. And then uh, the person, (laughs) it was so weird because in the moment, everyone was like all about it. It was like, yeah, man, like I just do that. Like there's nothing else you could do. And I was like, okay. And then afterwards, like this person really wanted me to, the tune changed for some reason of where they were like, he needs to get stroked for this. And to the point where they said, if rules don't matter, then I'm just going to show up tomorrow and play shirtless. No and so, way said and that. So, yeah. And again, guys, I'm so much over par at this point. And Julie knows from the conversation we had, I did not care at all. So I was like, literally just get me a stroke. That's fine. But, but I how think did in you the, play it wrong? What were you supposed to do? I think I was supposed to play an unplayable and re tee or play an unplayable and throw from the first spot. It's playable. 
I guess, because there is there wasn't anything there wasn't anything that was no, safe. So I guess it said it was casual. So I, I think it's the same thing as like throwing it into like a sawgrass plant and being like, I yeah. can't physically get into this plant and throw. So then you just take an unplayable and take a stroke. So um that's what ended up happening. But it was very weird too. You guys know on hole 15, the water before you get over, you know, you're you're throwing your shot up into the left. And I, I guess that lake doesn't really exist unless there's a lot of rain. But it wasn't marked as casual or anything. Oh, on 14? Is it four is it 14? Yeah, yeah before the par five. Yeah. Before the par mm-hmm. five. Yeah, 14. And like someone threw it into the water and I like texted Phil being like, is this guy have to like walk out and throw this shot? Cause it's not, it's not listed as casual. And we looked up the casual rule. The casual water rule is not a great, it's not like really well defined in the PJ rule. Yeah, it's book. confusing. So that's where I said, what do you guys think about this? I think it should be, if you put your foot in like in that piece of paper in your lie, if you step your foot down and water comes up out of the ground and is like by your shoe, even though if you move your foot, you don't see any water. If you put your foot down and water comes up by your shoe, like that can I to me that should be casual. And Julie, that would have helped you in your mud pit. That, I was so mad at the mud pit, dude. I was right in the middle of a tire mark, bro. I was like, ah. But that takes away all like the gray area because yeah. like right now it's like there's there's a very weird gray area in it, but that's the only that's the only other con I had was like the the cliff situation there. I don't know why they've decided that those two cliffs are the only cliffs that are unplayable. Yeah. When there's a, there's a lot of, of other. I was playing with this one guy, and he was like trying to figure out how to throw Sorry. the shot for four minutes. <laughs> Cause he's on the side of a cliff. He's like Billy goating it over there. And I'm like, dude, I, I was literally thinking in my head, like I visualized, I don't know if this was a good thing. Again, I was in a weird spot, but I visualized like what it would look like if he slipped and fell. And I was like, oh, what no. would, what, it's like, what would I do if this guy <laughs> slipped and fell 30 feet down this cliff? <laughs> oh man. Um, all right. Yuli, you got anything else for the champ here? Nope. The champ. <laughs> yeah. How's that sound by the way? I love it. Yuli called me champ today when he and then he smoked me in our little round today. But oh no, oh, no. <laughs> it was a big I pillow fight. I shot like two under. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. You guys played they Vista? Both, yeah, yeah they both bogey hole eighteen. It was a battle. Tough. <laughs> what do, What do they have as a eighteen now? How they've changed that hole all the time? What is it? What is it now? Um, Actually, a tricky little guy. Yeah, it's pretty fun. They throw from a tee pad that's like. 150 feet further left so you're like throwing more over the water okay it's like it it might be an easier angle but it looks a lot cooler they still doing that like the triple mando thing there on that hole too no no not anymore it's, like gone. A, it's like an island green kind of oh. i remember yeah, cool. do you guys remember the last tournament i think eagle threw a disc on that hole he didn't throw the disc that he wanted to throw. He threw a disc that he was okay losing. Do you guys remember that? Are you talking about the triple manual when you missed it high? I, there, he was like, it was the final hole of the tournament. Cause I think that was the year that it ended at Vista for some reason. I can't remember what year that was, but he was playing. And I remember him saying something along the lines of like, he didn't want to throw one of his discs and lose them. So he threw a disc that wasn't the, like the right shot disc for that hole. Simply, I thought that was just a wild thing, which I don't know if he would still do the same thing. I still, again, I but... do that all the time when I'm on. You a would hole. do that hole eighteen? Well, to probably win a not. Tournament? Probably not there, but I definitely <laughs> throw discs that I don't want to lose. Oh yeah, for sure. I lost. How many discs did you guys lose at Olympus? I didn't None. Lose any. No oh. one. I lost it in that casual lake. Because oh, yeah. I played it, I played it blind. I was playing the par five, and I did a big turnover. <laughs> I didn't know there was a cliff to the right, and it was just like my best nuke just. Oh, I, lost, like, uh, I lost like five discs on purpose, actually, because Peter brought a bunch of ledgestone discs, and he had me just chuck them off the mountain on the hole eighteen for like little Easter eggs for people to find. Oh, that's I thought I didn't know if you were throwing those to people or not. So you're just chucking those to who knows where. Yeah, he told me to do it, so I was like, all right. 
Go find yourself a new Ledgestone disc over there. Well, I have have a... Yeah, I have a sick nuke on Hole 18 if anyone wants to find that. Listen, that that's I played, gone. I played so bad on some of these holes, I found lost discs. <laughs> that like one I, I was telling you about? I four? found other people's lost discs. I was just like finding all this stuff, <laughs> looking for my stuff. There were five <laughs> discs. Five discs that weren't ours in the fairway. And we're trying, I mean... That was a hole that they definitely needed a spotter. They had a lot of spotters, but five or four, they needed a spotter because you would throw and people would go on the sawgrass. You have no idea. We were looking yeah. for discs and someone's like, hey, I got a yellow one right here. Everyone's like, no one threw a yellow. I'm like, all right. Oh, there's a purple <laughs> over here. No one threw a purple. There was so many discs just in the fairway on that oh, hole. Brody, last thing. Great yeah. story. Okay. Here hole we go. 18, second round, playing oh, with boy. my group. Get to the last hole. You're going to love this. Guys on the tee pad, getting ready to throw, stops, looks at the group, and says, guys, I don't want to shake hands or do anything on the last hole. I want to do it after. Heck yeah. And I go, <laughs> dude, like you stopped us. <laughs> you, <laughs> you could have just thrown. <laughs> you could have just went. None of us were like doing that. It was the weirdest thing ever. I literally said that. So I wanted to tell you. I now you that. guys are now you guys are ruining everything. You guys are stopping no, it's just, it's and being process. like, no, 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 no. This is happening. Did you guys fist pump on hole 18's T? A B, you and Ricky? He gone. Oh, he doesn't want to answer that question. All right. I asked him one tough question. He bounces. Look at this guy. This guy's scared <laughs> of the tough questions. That's what. Dude, you're ruining things, Brody. The guy literally stopped, looked at us. <laughs> None of us were going to do it. And he goes, just so you guys know, like, can we not? And then, and then he said, this was hilarious. He goes, well, I just didn't want you guys to stop me when I was throwing. <laughs> I've seen people do that though. Yuli. Like what? Yuli, I've seen people do that. I'm like in the middle of getting ready to throw. Oh, and sure. Someone like comes up to like fist bump middle, like getting ready. But, uh, AB, I asked what you cut out there. I asked, did you and Ricky fist bump before uh, teeing off on hole 18? That's a yes. That's a confirmed yes. Was that? I didn't hear him. I don't hear him. He's muted. He said yes? He's saying yes. For sure they did. You can read lips? Mm-hmm. I've seen some people shake their head like this and say no. <laughs> so I got to wait. I got to wait for audio to confirm this. Oh, can't hear you, buddy. Okay, hold Tyler, up a let's one. Get him back. Get him back. Hold up a one if you did. If you did shake, if you did. Okay, okay, he did. <laughs> All right, there we go. We got visual confirmation that he did shake hands. Did you stop um, him in the middle of his throat? <laughs> yeah, Ricky. Ricky threw first there. Ricky threw first. Maybe he that was game. The hey, 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 hey. Stop, that was stop, game, stop. gamesmanship from uh, AB. Um, <laughs> I did. I did get a, a little bit of a chuckle out of one of the guys I was playing with because he did. He was the one that initiated it all and was like, "Hey, good playing with you. Good playing with you." And someone like brought it up, being like, "Oh, yeah, Brody doesn't really like doing that." And I was like, it, "It's not like I don't like it. It's just I just said it was fun playing with you." And I was like, "But like, what if you're a douchebag on hole 18 now? I can't. I told you already. It was fun playing with you." I can't take that back. You have that on me now. Like, I want to wait until the final, you know, tap out to, to make my decision on whether or not it was fun playing with you. Um, I think we have AB back audio. You hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I do have a final friend I, kept calling me. You're fine. You're very popular. <laughs> you're winning a lot of tournaments. I do have a final question though for you. Yeah. Final question. How was it? Everyone taking score. Um, I I didn't mind it. I usually would try to do the PGA live before, but during the first nine holes of the second round was pretty bad because nobody nobody had any service or any access to the app. Oh. <laughs> so I ended up yeah, we didn't nobody knew what the live score was happening. The only one who had service actually was the guy who wasn't even from America, Niklas. He has a completely European phone <laughs> plan. And his was the only one that worked. Oh but yeah. So I ended up just taking making a U score card and putting in the scores because I didn't have a paper one. 
Ooh, don't say that too loud. <laughs> PGA might come after you using uh, Udisc. <laughs> I, I don't mind. I don't mind using the the thing. I think it's. I think we should all use paper because I didn't thing, have a problem. All of us doing the scores. It didn't. But but when the thing crashes, guess what happens? You can't take score, which yeah, is exactly was, what happened. I didn't even take score for nine of the holes, and I was like, I'm not going to get stroked for this. I don't have another mm-hmm. option. They called me after the tournament, like five hours after, and are like, "Hey, man, can you like, can you like hit your score thing?" <laughs> I'm like, "What? <laughs> Confirm your route." <laughs> For real, they that did because I that I got done and we did it all by paper, and I'm like, "All right, we got a paper one. Are we good? Like, I'm not gonna wait here till the PDJ figures out how to get their site back up." And they're yeah. like, "Yeah, you're good." And then they called me up. They're like, "Hey, can you can you hit confirm on your scorecard? <laughs> you're messing everything up." I'm like, "All right." <laughs> yeah, I thought That's that funny. was the only weird thing about all of us keeping scores that it didn't actually seem at the end that you needed to all keep scores. Cuz I did yeah. paper um I did paper all three rounds and and maybe it was because we were, you know, in last place that they really didn't care, but it just seemed like <laughs> the person I was handing my scorecard to was just taking it and like putting it in the Throwing trash. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think, I mean, I could have, I could have wrote some, you know, Egyptian letter in, in there instead of a number. And I don't think anything would have changed. So, nope. um, all right, AB, you have anything else? You, you've been awesome so far <laughs> Yeah. on the pod. Um, just I know everyone loves to... having you on here. Yeah, shout out to my sponsors, Discraft, Grip, Pastry Dyes, and my friends and family. And yeah, go over to teamdiscraft.com, get yourself a jersey. It's crazy how many people support me, especially in Arizona. Like today we came out and there's a whole group of four players playing in the jersey. I just won it on Sunday, so that was pretty cool to see. Yeah. And yeah, the support is unreal. It's just so many people have been pulling for me, and I'm glad to finally do one for them. What was your uh, celebration dinner? Texas Roadhouse, baby. Again. That's how it's done. Get the rolls. You know <laughs> yeah, how it's bet. done. All right. Very cool. We appreciate you, AB. Congratulations. Thanks for coming on, taking the time, and uh, good luck this upcoming week. And everyone else will see you in Waco. Sweet. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Take it easy, brother. Have a good one.